This is my prayer house. This is where I come to meet my best friend. Actually, I call it Mount Zion House of Prayer. It's built on the highest point in elevation on the ranch, almost 2,000 feet. Uh, I saw this little thing in the spirit, and I drew it out on paper, drew the lines, and I decided to make it manifest. So I had the contractors come, and they turned it into wood and stone and glass and carpet. I actually built it out of a, a theme in prayer that God spoke to me almost 30 years ago, actually. Uh, when Jesus was in a certain place, his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, when you pray, say. And then I taught many years ago that there are seven different steps in prayer, each one of those in the Lord's Prayer being a skeletal form on which you hang the structure of your prayer. And so I have eight sides in here, the one that you enter, and then the seven sides that follow that principle of the Lord's Prayer in seven steps. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In earth it is as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And then the great name of God in the book of Revelation. He is thee. Amen and amen. The reason I brought you here today is because I wanted you to see the prayer house, but I wanted to talk with you about meeting places, trysting places. More than 30 years ago, I, I preached a message actually in our uh, organizational conference that I was a part of. I think I was 19 years old when I first preached the message, When Strangers Meet. Some folks call it mercy and truth. And then I preached for many years that same theme. As a matter of fact, in my pastorate of 20 years, I preached this message every Easter Sunday morning. Just a few months ago, Bishop Eddie Long asked me to preach this word to the uh, house in Atlanta, New Birth Missionary Baptist Church. So what you're about to see is an old, old theme in a brand new place. I hope you'll be blessed by this word when strangers meet. Psalm 85, verse 5. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Now, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. My text just briefly today is in verse 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Everybody okay? When strangers meet. Let's all say strangers. Am I doing something wrong? We doing okay? Let's all say strangers. David is crying out of his spirit. Probably now by the time he writes this psalm, he has been enthroned, crowned three times at Hebron, prophet, priest, king. He is a mighty man, the mightiest man on the face of the earth. He is anointed of God. He is anointed by the people. He's received. The city he lives in, Jerusalem, is called the city of David. He has built now a tabernacle for the Lord God that has no veil. It's called the tabernacle of David. He has opened a window in the dispensations so that he has depicted and is showing a glorious, marvelous praise in the earth that heretofore has never been known. 
He has invented instruments on which to give God glory. Stringed instruments, lutes, harps, flutes of all kinds. He is now preparing the Levites according to the order that God has given the singers in their places, the instrument players in their places. David is a happy warrior, a happy warrior, carving out a kingdom with a sword. But after a while, even with songs and with joy, sometimes the years get heavy. The crown is heavy. Sometimes it carries with it a great weight of responsibility. He's sitting in his throne one day, and he's wondering. I think it must have been the day after Nathan came back. Because David in his exaltation and in his great praising heart decided to build God a house. And he called Nathan up, if you please. Maybe on a wire and a can or something. Anyway, he got him on, got him on the line and said, listen, I'm going to build a house for the Lord to live in. I said yesterday in our teaching time, really what David had in mind was he wanted to bring God up to his own standard of living. He said, I live in a house of cedar. And then he looks out the window and he said, and the Lord God dwells in curtains. He's out here in a flapping tent. I think I'll build God a house like my house. And God answered back in the night, even though Nathan seemed excited, the preacher seemed excited. He said, do all that is in thine heart. But then he came back in the night and said, God never said he wanted you to build him a house. And that's what God is saying to new birth. God really didn't say for you to build him a house. He said, I'm going to build you a house and give you a Messiah for a son. What God is saying in this city right now is you can labor and labor and labor to build a house for God, but it'll never be what God can do if you'll just let him use you and let him build his own house through you. We have a jealous Jesus on our hands. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And we're not letting him do it. We're trying to do it for him with all of our ingenuity, all of our programs, all of our ideas. And God is saying today on this monumental day, if you will move into a place of glorious praise and worship. I heard the sound in this house this morning. It was almost deafening. It was more than just shouting. It was a sound. I thought maybe we had gotten the angels to join us here. I thought I heard other choruses. I thought I heard more than the ladies' choir. Come on, talk back to me. I believe we stirred the angels up this morning. I think Gabriel leaned over and said, Somebody's. Who is that singing? I think they maybe leaned over the balconies of heaven and looked down on new birth and said, who is that down there? Nobody ought to be able to do that in the earth. And because of pain and brokenness and wildernesses walked through and deserts endured and crosses gone over, we're able to stand on this side and sing a song of Moses and the Lamb. And the Bible said that nobody in heaven or in earth can sing that song like the redeemed of the Lord can sing it. But when Nathan said to David, you can't build God a house, there was a letdown in his spirit. You know, as long as we can do something, we feel important. As long as we got a job, that's why folks hang on to, to jobs and titles. Because they feel naked if you take that away. But I'm remembering something about this same man, David. Is it all right if I just preach a while today? I've been teaching until I'm tired. I want to preach. I'm remembering that when he finally went back and got the, how, the ark of God out of the house of Obedidim, you remember that he went before the ark of God to Jerusalem when they came to bring it back out of its captivity. This was, of course, after they had determined that there had to be a certain order. I think Friday night we called it the due order. Would you say that with me, due order? Do order. 
The word do comes from Elohim. It means the God order. It is the only order there is. It's the God order, the do order. And we did not do it, David said, after the due order. And so good people died trying to help God. Use a died trying to study the ark to keep it from falling off an ox cart because it shouldn't have been on an ox cart in the first place. We got some good Christian people in Atlanta who are spiritually passing away because they're trying to to help God in an old system that God is not going to put up with any longer. He did for a while, even to his own people, said at the time of that ignorance, God once winked at. There's a little time God gives you a space in time when you may not know what to do and don't know how to do it. He may just wink a little bit and say, okay, come on, grow on up a little bit more. Wink. But then after a while, he stops winking and says, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm commending all men everywhere to turn around. And that's what has gone forth. A cry has gone forth in new birth that God's not putting up with trying to get new spirit in old wineskins any longer. God's not going to let you put new wine in old bottles. The bottles will burst. You can't put a new piece of garment on an old garment. It'll tear again. God wants to make you over a brand new vessel, something that can glorify him, something that can hold the amount and volume of his presence that he wants to pour out in this city. And if you remember David, when they finally got the order right, he was happy as we are today. And he danced. The scripture says naked. Actually, it means he had on a priest's ephod. He was naked in the eyes of his wife. She said, oh, wasn't the king glorious today as he danced naked before the maidens of the land? She was just jealous what she couldn't stand. Well, he wasn't naked without clothes altogether. He was naked without his kingly robe. Because if you ever truly bring the ark of God into your life, you're going to lay down the fact that you work at the bank when you come to church. You're going to take off the coat that says, I got money when you come in the house. You may have driven up here in a Mercedes, but you're going to take that off when you walk in here. If your shoes are not slick on the bottom, so you can worship God, give him a little bit of glory in the house. Don't come in here and act like you do out there. Take off that kingly robe. Put on a priest garment. Everybody in here has got to have a priest garment on. But it was really bad news for David, bad news for him, that he couldn't do something for God. God said, I, I'm going to build you a house. Now he doesn't know what to do. He's done things. He's been, all his life he's been doing things. He doesn't know how to enter into this dimension of not doing things. doesn't mean that we stop working. doesn't mean that we stop lending. doesn't mean that we stop going. It doesn't mean that we stop reaching. It doesn't mean that. It means that I have come to a place in my spirit, in my man mind, where I realize that I cannot, by eating the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, I cannot, by my own mentality, by my own understanding, understand how to do the work of God. I don't know who to win. I don't know who to witness to. I don't know who to talk to. But the Spirit knows all things. I don't know where to go, but the Holy Ghost knows where to go. There are too many things to do, but the Holy Ghost knows which one to do today. Is anybody talking back to me in this house? And when I'm willing to lose my mind and come into a place in God where I literally take the mind of Christ, I literally, it's not that I don't ever make a mistake again, it's that I grow up and get rid of a childish mind that has to suck its thumb every Sunday and need somebody pat me on the back to keep me saved. Come on, talk back. It's that spirit that says, hey, listen, I am going to glorify the Lord. I'm going to come and bring my life and bring my heart and bring my mind and bring my spirit. It's a difficult thing to come to sometime. When you brought your first fruits today, you stepped into a brand new life, a brand new world where you have never walked before. You are about to be talked to in the middle of the night in a vision. You're about to be spoken to first thing in the morning before you brush your teeth and you get up and stare in the mirror and you say, who is that? God is going to wake you up in the morning and say, this is what I have for you today. Suddenly your life, you've heard it, preachers talk about it, folks talk about it, but God's looking for a whole corporate man, a whole church who can live in that realm of the Spirit where God literally can direct you day by day, hour by hour. It was frightening to David. I think what was more frightening than that was that he had carved out his kingdom with a sword 
And the words that smote him and stuck in his mind were that Nathan had told him, you can't build God a house because your hands are full of blood. You're a bloody man. He must have gotten up out of his throne, left his crown, the golden scepter rattles off onto the rug, and he must have thrown that royal robe back down again across a chair. And while the guards are saying, oh, sir, just a minute, your majesty, we've got to, no, leave me alone, go on. No, but you can't go out. You can't go out. Like you, we, we, we'll go out just in front of you here. Just a, no, no. Leave me alone. Pushes them out of the way. Brushes them out of the way. Moves them. There are times, Bishop, when you just don't want anybody around. Even if they're trying to take good care of you. Just look. Just His heart is heavy. He's lonely. I think he must have gone out. I think maybe he wandered in a place where maybe as a boy he had wandered. He's going down a long trail, hollowed out by the hooves of the sheep, where as a lad he used to. It's only four miles, you know, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. He must have walked that way and then over you know, Jesse's backyard, down over the hill, rocky hillsides, down past a little cave where one time with a big overhanging rock he must have written down on the back of a little piece of parchment, there is no rock like ours. And finally, into a little vale in a small place where the grass was green and the water was a little deeper. And I think there is where he must have one day written down or at least memorized out of his spirit. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. And then it escaped his lips. I don't mind telling you that I've heard people say, don't question God. But there have been a few times in my life I just couldn't help myself. Because God's the only one who got the answer. I need need somebody to talk to me who knows the answer. I don't mean to question God like I think God's made a mistake. I mean to ask him because I need him to tell me something nobody else can tell me about. And David said, look, are you going to be angry forever? Are you going to draw out your wrath to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Seems like all we do is go smite the enemy. Now we're out at war over here. Now we're over there. Now we're taking that nation. Now we're fighting the Philistines. Now we're over here. And I want to build you a house and get this over with. And you're saying to me, Hey, you can't build me a house. You're a man of war. I'm tired of the fight. I'm preaching to somebody in here today who's weary with the fight. You're tired of the battle. And you know you can't get done what you want to get done in labor. And you want to come in to the dimension of God's grace. And then he did something that some of us don't do soon enough. He said, but I will hear what God the Lord will speak. If you're going to ask God a question, then shut up and let him answer you back after a while. said, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. He will speak peace to his people. Let them not turn again to folly. I'm not going back and ask him any more questions. Surely his salvation. Oh, I see it. I see it. And I think he was just under an old oak around the corner by a great rock where he had written a shelter in the time of storm because that was the place where he'd drawn some of the ewes and the little baby lambs up under the edge of the rock when it had been storm and lightning striking everywhere. And he was up under there. And he was saying he's a shelter in the time of storm. And he's standing here looking down across the pasture and out at the mighty oak. And as he stands here, he catches himself away in vision. And he is looking down that long perspective at a day. I think he must have thought it was today, this moment right now. Hey. It's going to happen right now. I will hear what Lord, what the Lord will say. He's going to speak peace to his people. Don't let them turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him. The glory, glory, glory. Come on, somebody say glory. Glory is going to dwell in our land. When is it going to happen, Lord? Oh, mercy and truth are going to meet together. Righteousness and peace are going to kiss each other. <laughs> truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord shall give his increase. That's what I want. Yeah. But David went to his grave looking for that. See, mercy and truth were strangers. They had never met. When truth was revealed, there was no mercy shown. They didn't know each other. Are we okay, Bishop? Am am I in a big hurry or just a little hurry? Just a little hurry. Are you all okay? 
Stay with me. My story will be done here shortly, okay? Mercy and truth were strangers. Do you remember the story of, well, there are so many of them, I don't know just really which one to pick out, but you do remember the story of Saul going into the village of the Amalekites. Do you remember that? And he was supposed to kill all of the people. Remember that? God said, go utter, this is the term, utterly destroy the Amalekites for what they did to my people when the, they were passing through the land. They wouldn't give them bread. They wouldn't give them water. Now I'm going to come back and pay them back now that my people have become a mighty army. I want you to go kill and don't spare. Kill men, women, children, cattle, sheep. Utterly destroy them. Who said to do that? God did. Now Saul comes back to Samuel. Remember that? And he, he comes back and Samuel is watching up the road and here comes Saul, the king back, and he's got Agag, king of the Amalekites, left alive. He's got cattle, looks like prize cattle, and the best of the sheep. And the cattle are lowing and the sheep are bleeding and they're coming down the road and Samuel says to him, what have you done? Hey, didn't the Lord say to utterly destroy the Amalekites? And he said, oh, and this is what they always do. Tut, tut, tut. Over to yeah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's the way all of these spirits always do. They always start out worshiping God and then telling you a lie. He said, oh, I have saved only the best of the cattle, and I have saved only the best of the sheep, and I've kept the king alive so he can just serve you, you know. Yeah. And Samuel said, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken is better than the fat of rams. Disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft. What was he saying? Hey, it was righteousness to kill every mama, even the ones carrying babies. A little 14-year-old boy, a soldier, chasing him down the street. Finally, he throws a spear, sinks it right through his back, out through his lungs, carrying white, frothy, red, dripping lung tissue on the point of the iron. And as he falls, gurgling in the blood, and a daddy runs out of a stable to pick him up, an arrow catches him full in the neck, and he's down. And these Amalekites are dying in the street. And it was righteousness. As a matter of fact, Saul was judged unrighteous because he didn't do it to every one of them. Because righteousness and peace were strangers. They had never met. Achan... Achan, come with me. Let's stand in the valley of Achor just a little while. And uh, we're standing here. It's almost like a county fair. Well, what's going on? Have thing going today? Doing good? You got your rock? Good. Okay. You got your rock? That's not a very big rock. Get a bigger rock. We need rock. Yeah. What, what are you doing out here today? Oh, we're going to kill a man. Going to do what? Oh, we're going to kill a man, his family, and his children, and everything. Yeah. You are? Mm-hmm. What you going to do? Just going to stone him to death. And listen, by the way, how's a hamburger stand doing up there? I mean, just common everyday stuff, you know? Hey, what are you talking about? Well, uh, a man sinned. What's, it, what's his name? Achan. Or what did he do? Well, he, you know, we, we just came through this battle. God gave us great victory, but he required that we leave the first fruits. Oh, don't, don't, don't jump out of your chair right now. He said, I'm not going to let you touch the first fruit of that victory because that's the first battle you've won when you came across into this new land. That's why this is the day of first fruits. <clears throat> You're coming into a new land of order and power and victory in God. And you can't touch that first fruit. That's holy unto the Lord. But Achan and his family, you know, we went through the whole thing. You know, and found out the Holy Ghost just pointed him out after a while. And there he was. He had taken a garment and he would taken some gold and silver and hid it under his tent. And so when he was found out, of course, you know, we've got to kill him. Oh, don't do that just a minute. I'll tell you what. If you just go in this little time capsule with me, we'll slip over to Atlanta, Decatur, and we'll go into New Birth Missionary Baptist Church this morning, and you won't have to kill him. Because... 
Bishop will be preaching, and as soon as he's through preaching, he'll walk out on the front and he'll say, all right, anyone who has done something you shouldn't have done this week, you come on, you get up. If you're not saved, God's going to bring you into the fold today, and, he's, and, and we'll just get aching, and the family will get him up there, and we'll pray with him, and the Lord will forgive him. And be, oh, no, can't do that. Why not? That's what we all do. Now, that's the way it's supposed to be. No, no. Sorry about that. Truth is revealed. Aching sin. There's no mercy shown because mercy and truth were strangers. They had never met. It made the prophets lonely, made the patriarchs lonely, made the men of the old Bible and the women lonely. But David saw it. He had a window in the dispensation. He saw it like no one else saw it. That's why we still sing his psalms in the New Testament church and feel the glory of God. That's why we still quote his words when we want to truly praise. Oh, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Who said that, David? Way back there. He had a window. He saw all the things that were to come in Christ and in the church and glorified God in a tabernacle that was unlike his own because today, as it was in David, he was able to eclipse time and move into the eternity of God where all things are done so he praised God in the old Bible like you can praise him in this New Testament church today but David saw it he said there's coming a day the full salvation is, is coming to his people it's going to happen when mercy and truth they're like two tracks running way down somewhere they join together mercy and truth someday Truth is going to be revealed and mercy will be there. Someday righteousness will be required and peace will be there. But today mercy and truth are strangers. And righteousness and peace have never met each other. And he died never seeing that day. I'm closing. Now when I say I'm closing, you know, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> Don't take it too seriously. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I guess maybe we should go into another picture frame. We've been with Aiken. I don't want to make this too morbid, but I think I understand why David was bleeding. I think I understand why he was hurting. In that circle out there stands a man and a woman. She's probably holding a small baby. There's a little boy holding on to the leg of his pants over here. Aiken's standing around. Now they're throwing the furniture all out there in a the pile. Now they've got the sheep and the cows out there, and they're all standing around, and everybody's just in a big circle. I'm not talking about 100 people. I'm talking about thousands of people. Every one of them with a rock under their arm. I said mercy and truth were strangers. Truth was revealed. There was no mercy shown. When Joshua said, now the rocks began to fly, it's hard to dodge them all coming from every direction. It's difficult to understand what a mother thinks when she looks at what used to be the face of her baby. Eight pounds of love in her hand oozing through her fingers now. And then the little boy is looking up saying, Daddy, what, what are you doing this time? They don't understand. Children, wife, everybody dead. Mercy and truth were strangers. They had never met. I wish I could go get David up from his grave. Because I'm in another city now. I'm walking. I have been by a fire. I heard a man curse and swear and say, I don't know the man. And then I saw some others gambling for a garment and I've been looking at all of this and it seems to me the evening is quite ominous. It seems as dark and lonely as all the other pages of the past Bible. But something in my spirit, I mean the sacrifice of the day is hanging on me, but something in my spirit tells me this day is not like any other day I've ever lived. Something is telling me a new birth missionary Baptist church no other day you have ever experienced in the history of your church is like this day today. And God knows it's not because I'm here. It's because you are here. <sighs> what is this? But how, how do you, why do you feel so excited? What you so, I just feel something. Yeah. 
I'm walking through the streets and now I've come around a corner and there he is. He's trying to carry that cross. But he's weak. You can tell dehydration has taken over his body. His biceps, his triceps, his thigh and calf muscles seem to be lined and strong, but you can see the quivering in them. He's weak from lack of rest. He's weary from lack of water. He's been beaten. Look at him. I want to get David up. What are you going to get David up for? He saw enough pain and misery. Hey, I'd, 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 I'd like to go get Achan and get him. But there's no need to do that. Well, I mean, this is another bad deal. This is another one of God's things. God is angry again. That's what David said. Are you going to be angry forever? The answer is no. God's not going to be angry forever. There's going to come a time sometime if you can find the moment where mercy and truth meet together, where righteousness and peace kiss each other. That's the moment that salvation comes to his people then what are you trying to get him up in the middle of a crucifixion? Because something in my spirit, it's like the high pipes in a great cathedral have started playing. It's like the wind in the top of trees is singing a hymn I've never heard before. Something in my spirit tells me this is the first day of the rest of my life. It doesn't matter what I see. The weariness on his face. His back looks like a plowed field. His face has been beaten. He's been smitten with an open hand by 619 big soldiers as hard as they can slap him. You've never seen a man in a boxing match. You've never seen a person in a car wreck that looked any worse than he did. The prophet said he was marred more than any other man. Nobody looked as bad as he looks. His eyes swelled shut. His face splotchy where beard has been plucked out. And someone has diabolically weaved a crown of thorns and shoved it down on his head and the little white hypodermics have pressed into the skull and tributaries little little streams of blood are staining the corners of his eyes he has rubbery mucus hanging from his lips and face where the people have spit on him in shame while he drug his cross. And now he's down. He's fallen. Somebody's being compelled to carry the cross for him. And now they're driving in those nasty nails. You can see his body twist and arc upward when the nail goes through his wrist. <laughs> And then the other one, and you can see the agony and the pain that rips through his body. His mind is numb. Why do you want to wake the ages up? Don't get the prophets up. This is another one of God's bad deals. God's just mad at us. No. Come on, David, get up. Somebody wake up all the Old Testament prophets. Somebody wake up all the lonely ages. Somebody wake up all the years of labor. Somebody go get all the weary souls who died and didn't quite see the promise. Because today, of all days in the world, something is going to happen that has never happened in the history of mankind. Now they're mocking him. I watched them a while ago. I think what sent me after his cross and drove me to follow along is because while I stood in the courtyard below the balcony where they had him tethered and where they had him tried a few minutes ago, I heard him being mocked. And while the congregation and the group around were being called, come on, all together now, here, here are the way the lines go. Crucify him, let his blood be on us and on our children. You got it? Okay, you got it over here in the soprano section. You got it over here in the alto section. You got that? Okay, crucify him. Do that twice and then let his blood be on us and on our children. Okay, all together now. Come on, chief priests are whipping up the people. Come on, you ready? All right, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and on the children. And somebody is pushing in from behind me and saying, who is, what is it, ma'am? What do you want? A little lady. She's not very big. A little lady pushes me over. And I say, what are you here for? I want to talk about him. Yeah, but they're just about to crucify him. He's an imposter. I heard the chief priest say so just a little while ago. He, he's a blasphemer. <laughs> Never, you ever seen him before? No. no. They, they, he says he's a prophet, but I don't think he's a prophet. I think he's non-prophet. 
because everybody around here is ready to kill him. No, he's not. He, 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 you know who he is? No, I don't know who he is. Well, I was in a crowd one day. And for 12 long years, I had spent everything I had on the doctors and on the physicians. Y'all can scream all you want to. You can say crucify him if you want to. But I want to tell you, I just touched the hem of his garment. And he healed me and made me well. And someone else is pushing me over here. And I said, yeah, who are you? And he said, you can call him anything you want to. But I'm telling you, he is the giver of life. He is the way. Shut up, be quiet. The truth. Who are you? My name is Lazarus. I laid for days in a cold grave. And that man spoke my name. And I heard the master of life. Who did you say he is? He's the way, the truth. Did you say truth? Truth, yeah. He's the way, the truth, truth. Truth, did you say truth? You say his name is truth? How long did you say it goes? Everlast, truth. Did somebody say truth? I've been looking for a day. There's a day somewhere where truth and mercy, I don't think it may happen today, but mercy and truth are going to meet together somewhere. <laughs> did you say that? Somebody else moves up and said, that's all of heaven's truth. I'm not ashamed to tell you I went in the nighttime. My name is Nicodemus. But he looked at me and named my church for me and said, you're going to be born again. New birth is coming to you. Life came into me that my mentors never taught me. Truth that my teachers never knew. This man spoke one sentence and changed and rearranged my entire life. You can crucify him if you want to. But I want to tell you who he is. He's all of heaven's truth incarnate. Truth. Did you say truth? I can't get away from it. Truth. Well, where's mercy? If I could find mercy, if that's truth, I, where's mercy? Oh, mercy is down yonder behind the veil sitting on her lonely seat, the mercy seat, between the cherubim where she's been locked up so many times before. She was there when they stoned Achan. And when she heard the crying of the baby and the screaming of the little boy, she got up. But she couldn't get out. Locked behind a veil. Lonely without her lover. She was there when the men cried in pain and the mothers tried to hold their unborn babies with their entrails in their arms as they were butchered and slaughtered. And it looked like God was mad at everybody. She got up. When David said, are you going to be mad at us forever? And she rejoiced for the first time in millennia when she heard the prophetic word that she was a going to meet her lover. <laughs> going to come a day, honey, when you're going to meet truth. <laughs> but she's been here now a long time in this cold room. Only once a year, a priest all covered up and with the blood of bulls and goats slopping out on her chair. She moves to the side while they go through their ritual that really doesn't deliver much of anything. Just rolls it on for another year. And then the veil sweeps back and darkness envelops her. And she holds up the Shekinah above her head and bows herself in mercy and sits for another generation and another and another and another and then she was sitting thus one day and she heard her lover's voice it was a 
lad speaking, a small, immature, kind of squeaking kind of voice that said, Wist thou not that I must be about my father's business? But when she heard it, she said, That's him. That's truth. If I can just get to him. And she's up and pacing the veil again. If I could just get out of here. I know truth is out there. And now it's been 18 years. She went back and sat down again. And then she heard the voice of the father say, This is my beloved son. And she's up again. He's still here. He's in the earth. He's alive here somewhere. If I could just get out of here, because mercy and truth were strangers. They had never met. And then, it's been a long time now. She caught little things in the wind, little words here and there, spoken up down the street, thought she recognized his voice one time. Thought she heard it. But tonight it's cold and lonely here. Lightning is flashing. Or is it night? Maybe it's day. I've lost track of time. I know it must be day, but it's dark as night. And what is this shaking? Will I be here forever in my lonely prison? And she's sitting lonely. And he is hanging there now, heaving there now, stretched like a piece of canvas on a frame there now, heaving up on his thighs and then back down hanging on his biceps. The muscles have twisted the vascular system to pieces. He's bleeding internally. Big black bags of blood hang like sacks under his arms. His pectorals are twisted and torn away from the rib cage. He has suffered and strained up on his calves, his toes pointing straight down so long that it's ripped the muscles away from his privates. He's rupturing all over his body. He's been beaten so badly with that cat and nine tails that when it wrapped around his stomach, it ripped into his abdomen. You can hear him breathing a hundred yards away, not just through his esophagus, not just the bronchii. You can hear him wheezing through the side and the holes where his bowel is starting to protrude and you can see that it's turning black with the air hitting it and he is suffering but she hears him too that's him he said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me ah, and she got up that's him that's him if I could just get out of this little room. I would bring every lonely man and woman in here with me if I could just get out to them. If I could just get out. And then she heard him again. I, I thirst. <laughs> And she's up again and pacing back and forth. The lightning is flashing. The thunder catches up the tone of his voice, rolls it down the rabbled hill, across the cobblestones of the temple, rattling against the veil. She hears his voice again. This time, she's almost hopeless because he said, Father, into thy hand. I commend my spirit. And then she puts her hands over her ears. He's saying something she can hardly bear to hear. It is finished. And in desperation, she rubs the veil. But suddenly, a sound she's never heard, a ripping, tearing sound from the top 
it starts down. The veil is tearing down. Oh, there's a mighty hole in this place. Mercy scraped from her garments the blood of bulls and of goats. Step through the veil. Out through the inner court. Out through the outer court. Like a mama looking for her baby. And then she follows the digging ridge in the road. Splattered on each side by blood. Until she bumps into the foot of an old rugged cross. And when she looked up, mercy and truth met each other. Would you get up on your feet, please? Righteousness and peace kissed each other. And a whole new day was born for all of us. We'll never be lonely again, Bishop. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. What a glorious marriage. Redemption through his blood and his sacrifice. I just want to say this, though. We thank him so much for what he did and for what he's brought together in our lives, but we don't want to stay there. That's the beginning place. We want to go on into the truths of God. We want the proceeding word to work in us. So. Since he's done so much for us, we need to do something for him. Let's prepare ourselves to work in his kingdom. I just pray that the blessing of the Lord will stay on you and, and that the words that have been spoken today will be a great uplift in your spirit. Be sure and write to us at the office or call us and let us know what parts of this message or other things you're hungry for we can send to you. And until I see you again, be blessed, be strengthened, be encouraged in the Lord Jesus. Everyone,